come for 2.0 of Josh Green's talk, showing us historic Fredericton images. I could say a million and one things about Josh Green, uh, all of them good. Originally from a small rural community in Crombie Settlement in Victoria County, Josh Green went on to pursue a number of degrees in history, anthropology, and music at St. Thomas University, the University of Alberta, and Memorial University of Newfoundland. After accepting a position with the Provincial Archives of New Brunswick two years ago, he put his PhD studies on hold to work uh, at that institution's photograph uh, archivist. Josh's interest in the history of photography was piqued by having had the opportunity to work with William Go, well-known authority on historic photograph and printing processes. In addition to helping the public locate and research historic photographs, Josh has also had a number of pet projects related to the history of photography in New Brunswick, for which he is always seeking collaborators and volunteers, including searching for and identifying the oldest photos of the province, creating a list of New Brunswick's 19th century photographers, and a new project related to the role of women in early photography business in New Brunswick. Without taking up any more of Josh's precious time, I would like to introduce to you my colleague, my dear friend, Josh Green. <laughs> Thanks, Coral. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Uh, thanks very much for coming. Uh, I want to apologize to the, I think, one person in the audience who's seen a few of these pictures before, uh, Marion. So, yeah, <laughs> alrighty. So what I'm gonna talk about today, I'm gonna to show uh, street scenes, everyday life, and photos of some of our old buildings and spaces, uh, those which still exist and how they've evolved, how their uses and utility uh, shifts over time. And I'm gonna show some of our old buildings that were torn down, burned down, or otherwise destroyed to present a record of the city's rich architectural heritage that would be otherwise forgotten. Uh, also, although the focus of the talk is images from the 19th century, uh, later 19th century. Uh, I hope you won't run me out of here if I look at the 20th century, 21st occasionally, usually for the sake of comparison. So we'll poke into the other areas in time around that. So uh, the title photo here is one that I barely got to at the end of my last talk. It shows uh, Fredericton in the 1890s from the roof of what was called the Deaf and Dumb Institute uh, in Forest Hill. A uh, building which burned about 1897. So I want to show this one because it's kind of a rare overview of this part of Fredericton, uh, looking into the edge of Barker's Point, uh, mouth of Nashwalk uh, River, and uh, you see lots of interesting details when we zoom in. So I also use this as an opportunity to talk a little bit about the detail and resolution of old photographs, which I mentioned last time. Uh, I think because most people see them, are used to seeing old photos uh, kind of reproduced if, uh, in books or in low resolution online, uh, many people aren't aware that they're actually uh, tremendously high resolution, so they look better than a lot of digital photos that were taken in the uh, early 21st century, uh, and better than a, a ton of uh, 20th century photos too. So we can zoom in and see a few details here. Uh, this is from a York Sunbury Historical Society uh, picture actually. Uh, yeah, we can see Gibson leather on the left hand side and the tannery on the right hand and which I mentioned last time I think that we have very few images, there are very few images of shipbuilding in Fredericton. Uh, this is one of them that shows quite a large vessel under construction, it has some staging around it. Uh, you can see it just right here. So Fredericton wasn't really thought of as a shipbuilding center but Gibson did have ships, uh, Alexander Gibson. Uh, built with the logs floated down from Marysville and so on to transport leather and other products. So, uh, I love this one, it shows wood boats. It's just, these are all just little different crops and zoom ins on the same image that's from the title card there. Uh, the, the kind of low wide uh, belly boats here are wood boats. Uh, they were filled with wood, transported up and down the St. John River. And we can faintly see an early bridge across the Nashua River here, uh, which is kind of interesting. And Barker's Point with no settlement right on the edge there because probably would have flooded too badly. So anyway, <laughs> this is the Deaf and Dumb Institute. It's the only picture I've ever seen of it uh, near the foot of Forest Hill in the 1880s. 
So this building uh, had the misfortune of, well, the deaf and, dumb in, deaf and Dumb Institute had the misfortune of burning down a number of times, and they were forced to move all over town. So in the really early 1880s, the senator gifted his house to them for the use of, you know, as a Deaf and Dumb Institute. It burned shortly after, within a year or two, of him giving his house away, basically. Uh, so then they built this new place, uh, and this only lasted for about 15 years before it burned as well. So as you can, and it so burned in about 1897. Uh, as you can imagine, there's not a lot of pictures of it. It was around for so uh, such a short time. So anyway, one second here. Okay. Uh, yeah. So this is what it looked like after a burn. It's slightly less exciting, I know. Um, and this is something I just wanted to show as we're getting started. Uh, I'd never seen this until the lead up for this talk. It's uh, the first annual summer picnic of the York Sunbury Historical Society. So, uh, and they're at Camp Wayback, which if anyone knows where that is, I'd like to know, but it's probably close to Fredericton. So <laughs> anyway, there's a, a few kids in front as well. So I thought it was kind of a neat picture. None of the people I know are identified, but uh, yeah, we could study it and find some Scholars, probably. So, yeah, as I mentioned last time, early depictions of buildings matter, in part because uh, architects actually use them to remodel and recreate buildings in a historically accurate way. Uh, we get requests for this sort of thing uh, pretty often. Uh, they're also, uh, these old photos of buildings are also important kind of socially because they go a long way towards helping to show uh, and convince the public that our history and buildings and built heritage are actually important and worth saving. So showing them demonstrates in a palpable way how different built features of the landscape have been integral parts of our history and the lives of people in the city uh, for sometimes literally hundreds of years. So this is a, not a York Sunbury image, but this is a 18, 1863, 1864 picture of St. Mary the Virgin uh, Church in New Maryland, which some of you probably know. Uh, the village is interested in trying to save and restore and maybe open to the public, I guess, because the interior especially, especially is in fairly good condition. That's a beautiful church anyway. So this is a picture taken just about the time of its construction. And the original picture that this is taken from is a, a type of photograph called a carte de visite, which is about the size of a credit card. Um, and again, this is a vintage print from 63 or 64. And this credit card size image still contains enough detail that you can see, see the fine woodwork on the, the eaves, like the gingerbread trim type sort of thing, and all the individual shingles and all the sort of ornamentations. So it's pretty impressive. And it's from the time that, one of the reasons I, that we suspected at first it was from the time of construction and not later, other than many other factors, is all the ground, if you look closely, is freshly disturbed and the mortar work has just been, it's all white at the bottom and everything. So the dirt had settled shortly before they took this photo. So <laughs> yeah. And then along the same lines, this is, this is the York Sunbury image and this is the uh, uh, Holy Trinity Church in Lower St. Mary's. Sometimes I think wrongfully called Upper Majorville. I've, I've called it that before, but I was corrected. So uh, yeah, and this is another church that I think is, it, it is still standing and it's easy to drive by when you're going down river, but uh, it's a pretty little church that is extremely old as well. So some folks have asked for these images to try and advocate uh, uh, on behalf of saving them. So this is uh, officers of the 71st York Regiment in camp at Queen Square in Fredericton, uh, September 1897. In the background over their shoulders, we can see, and I'll zoom in in a second, uh, the Charlotte Street School slash now Art Center. Uh, so this shows kind of the shifting use values of places like Queen Square. And I think that showing the militia here, you know, the militia era predating the proper Canadian Army helps emphasize the age and significance of buildings like Charlotte Street. Like they've been around longer than the Canadian Army as it currently exists have been around. So that's kind of interesting. The buildings and the, and the Queen Square has, I mean, so it's kind of neat. We can see up over the guys' heads there, in the background, the familiar kind of art center spire. It's quite neat. Uh, a lot of you have probably seen this before. It's the, the Fredericton Bicycle and Boat Club. It was the clubhouse was built in 1895. Uh, you know, boating had always been popular in Fredericton as the St. John River was the main highway for transport for the first hundred and something years easily. Uh, bicycles have been popular at least since the 1880s. Uh, we can see lots of, yes, 
bicycle race or tour, as it was called, in the, about 1886 through downtown. And the Waverly Hotel is on the right-hand side there. And, yeah, and another one, uh, cyclists outside the legislature in 1886 with those uh, penny farthing big wheel bikes. So, uh, Looking at the Bicycle and Boat Club, uh, today it was just about, it was on the green downtown, just above the Beaverbrook Gallery or right around there. You can see the first uh, bridge to cross the St. John River at Fredericton. In the background, the Carlton Street wooden bridge. Uh, yeah, and uh, this one's kind of fun because there's a lot of, little details that you uh, you can pick out if you kind of poke around it. Uh, so the, the bridge that you can see in the background, the New Brunswick Premier A.G. Blair was a huge supporter of the bridge's construction. Uh, his critics dubbed it Blair's Paper Bridge, a phrase that some of you might have heard, uh, because he had, they had opted for cheaper crib work and wooden superstructure as opposed to more expensive stone and steel. So people who lived in Fredericton for a long time, and any of you folks would know, the ice gets pretty heavy, so they thought that this first bridge would be pushed out within the first year or two, so it was uh, heavily criticized. It opened in 1885 and survived a whole lot of ice jams, actually, and spring freshets until the arch wooden spans burned in 1905, and then they did reconstruct them from steel between uh, 1906 and 1910. But it stood for 20 years, and it was a fire that took it out, uh, not ice, actually, so it wasn't too bad. Um, yes, this is good. So if we look here, there's boys all over the place. This building is surrounded by ice, but they don't seem terribly concerned. So I want to thank uh, Coral for this little contextual uh, tidbit that she uh, gave me about the bridge, which relates to this picture here. Anyway, so we can see some boys out on the edge there. Well, w not on the edge. They're way out on the ice messing around. So anyway, uh, there was a newspaper clipping from 1886 where they were, someone was concerned about the new bridge. They said, if children are to be prevented from falling into the river and being drowned, the sides should be boarded up. That's a good idea. Uh, at present, the sides are open and seem to invite the average boy to try how near he can go to the edge of the planking without falling over. There's already a sufficiency of methods for killing off children in active operation, so there's no need to lay another trap for the underwary and adventurous. So. But uh, boys disregarded that anyway, so even if they boarded up the sides, they go walk around in the ice flow, so it can't be helped, I guess. The boys are prone to dangerous fun, and there's the bridge before it got taken out, so. Yeah, and the bridge fared a lot better than some of the other downtown buildings. I mean, as far as images of Fredericton go back in time, you know, even pre-photography, uh, there's famous lithographs and stuff of buildings being washed away by the ice, which is no surprise, I guess, when you build right on the shore. So that bridge, the paper bridge fared a lot better than this, uh, the mill, the outbuildings at this mill, which were taken away in 1887, about 1887. So wash that away with the ice. Um, so this bridge, yeah, seen here, it's about, uh, yeah, this is about 1902. It's a view down the bridge, the Carlton Street Bridge. The sides are boarded up well enough. Uh, the toll man, there was a toll man on the bridge. Uh, some of his duties included clearing manure from the decking. That's true, so you can see why that was required. I don't know what's in the center. That's not manure, but this might be. But, <laughs> so, but anyway, so this, um, oh yeah, so some of you may have seen these before, but before postcards were popular, picture postcards, which aren't even that popular anymore, I guess, uh, there were stereographs. So they were the first 3D pictures ever. So I was joking with someone earlier, it's, it's just after they figured out how to put photographs on paper as opposed to uh, metal and, yeah, copper plates and stuff. Immediately, as soon as they had 2D photographs, someone thought it was boring and they, they went and invented 3D photographs. So these were starting to get very popular in England in the 1850s, which is kind of the first decade of paper photography in this province. So uh, if any of you have used a, like a Viewmaster or whatever before, it's a little bit like that. But basically there's a left hand and a right hand image and you put them in this viewer here on the right and they're taken at just a hair slightly different angle to mimic the different angles of the, the viewing angles of the, you know, the two eyes in your head so that you have a left eye and a right eye image and you can adjust the focus and it actually uh, 
produces a pretty, like, fairly convincing 3D effect, so that's kind of interesting. So these are really hotly, uh, you know, traded around, and you could mail them, and they were collectible. People in Fredericton in the late 1800s had examples from all over the world, so. And people in New Brunswick were making them and selling them, and there was a real industry. So this is actually a photo of two guys holding the stereoscope in a garden in Fredericton, and it looks to me like it was used for an advertisement. It was taken for George Ta or by George Taylor, but it's obviously like a stage scene. They're showing how wonderful it is to hang out and look at stereographs. So, but this is at a time where you know, pre every kind of uh, there was there were no mass media other than you know books and newspapers, and pictures even you know printed in books were somewhat rare. So the fact that you could buy these high quality 3D images in the 1860s in New Brunswick, late 1850s. Uh, they were a real hit because they brought people in closer contact with uh, their province and also all over the world. They would have never seen pictures of any of these places. Uh, certainly not real photographs either, which these were. They weren't just cheaply printed, so a lot of detail. They were looking at a picture of a street scene somewhere, by the way. So, <laughs> And those were all kind of zoomed in from this glass negative. Uh, yes, this is kind of interesting about the bridge. Uh, it's, another, it's from another stereograph, an American stereograph, so Americans were interested in what we were doing up here apparently in 1902. Uh, this is the first bridge and it has a swinging span opening for, uh, uh, for a tall ship to go through. I did not know that the first wooden bridge also allowed ships to pass through it until I saw this picture about a week ago. So I'd never seen that. Uh, lots of people know that the railway bridge, the first one and the second one which exists now, could open up and let ships go through. but. Um, I'd never seen this before, so it's kind of interesting. The paper bridge had many features and was not taken away by ice, so yeah, he showed everybody. Uh, yeah, and then you can see it kind of turn sideways, and it looks to me, I don't know how they got them through there, but it's pretty tight, so I wouldn't want to be the guy maneuvering it, I don't think. Yeah, and this is a picture I just, I'd seen for the first time the other day, replacing the burned wooden spans with steel sometime between 06 and uh, 07 in the winter. Uh, it's hard to see what's going on, but zoom in a little bit. And we can see here there's steel spans on the side. And back left is the rarely seen Arctic rink, which is down here on the waterfront. Uh, skating rink, it burned in 1939. And then out of, you know, this would be like the normal school and justice building over here. But anyway, that's kind of a neat one. Uh, yeah, this is back to the bicycle and boat club. I only really included this because it was taken by the Babbitt family, who I'm going to talk a bit about, uh, especially S.W. Babbitt. So it was a family, um, a well-to-do Fredericton family. The York Sunbury Historical Society has a ton of their material, including photographs. Uh, what's really neat about them, though, is that they were some of the first, some of the earliest, uh, you could say, amateur photographers in the province. So some of the stuff that the Babbitts have taken that we have their negatives and prints of uh, shows us kind of the earliest uh, insight into domestic uh, life, leisure time, and some of the first uh, kind of unstaged photographs of the province come from the Babbitts. Basically the Babbitts around Fredericton and the Miller family of Millerton over in Miramichi are the two big early amateur collections we have from the 1880s, 1890s. Um, everything other than that um, comes basically from professional photographers, so you don't get to see people's home life and what they're up to and what they look like when they weren't paying you know, an arm and a leg for a picture in a studio, basically. So, with a stern face and everything. So, yeah, and just a couple more quick ones. There's uh, some colorized, these are hand colored photos by uh, Madge Smith. Uh, some of you might know her. She's probably the best known, certainly the best known early uh, female photographer in New Brunswick. And she learned some of her craft at Harvey Studios and sold her prints, sometimes for a decent amount of money. Now we have a ton of Madge Smith here. So this is uh, in the 40s. But uh, she was a talented uh, colorist as well, which, you know, even though color film existed in the late 30s uh, for still photos, uh, it was pretty uncommon and pretty expensive. So people continue to get pictures colorized uh, into the 50s. And yeah, we've certainly seen a lot of that. Another one by Madge, showing another with a gazebo and the bridge in the background. Yep, oh, that's that as well. So some time ago, not too long ago, we received a really interesting donation uh, related to the O'Dell family. 
Basically, to tell the story, there was a lady who was a descendant of the Foley's, after whom Foley Court is named, which is kind of on the edge of the Odell property, or Odell uh, Park today. So within the last six months, uh, a Foley descendant uh, came and brought these in, and their, their relationship to the Odell family, who, among many other things, gifted, obviously, the property of uh, Odell Park to, to the city, um, they, the, the Foley family had two or more generations of their family worked as domestic servants or other types of laborers for the Odell family. So the Foley's and the Odell's were closely connected. And this material stayed in this home on the left. Uh, yeah, oh no, this is the same. Uh, they, anyway, they stayed in this home until it was demolished and then they were basically in family storage and storage lockers until they were brought to us. Uh, in the past six months, so and there's some pretty neat stuff here. So basically, uh, what we're looking at, sorry about that, it's a fine balance. <laughs> yeah, uh, what we're looking at here is the uh, a series of photos from this that were in this home. Uh, it was a corner house on the Odell property, and uh, yeah, uh, on the bottom left we can see Ann Abrams. So this was Ann's cottage. Um, she lived there in her later years of employment as a caretaker slash domestic servant with the Odells. Um, the, yeah, after her death at the age of 78 in 1912, the property was gifted or sold to her nephews, John and Thomas Foley. And so we can see where we're looking at here. Yeah, it's a bit bright, but this is all Odell Park. For folks who don't know, Foley Court's here just off Hanwell Road. And that takes its name from the Foley family from whom these photos came. So. Uh, yeah, that's Anne in front of her cottage. That was gifted to her. Um, she worked for the Odell family for over 50 years. In the 1861 census, at the age of 28, she's listed as a domestic servant, or a domestic, with the Odells. She continued to serve them in some capacity up until her death at the age of 78. So uh, she appeared to have been the caretaker of W.H. Odell's daughters, named Ella, Fanny, and Mary, from their early childhood onwards. So anyone who knows about that part of the Odell family, uh, they know that for several years before his death, uh, W.H. Odell resided exclusively in Halifax, but his daughters remain uh, spinsters, kind of interesting characters. Um, Ella, Fanny, and Mary, they stayed mostly in Fredericton as they got older, where Anne continued to serve them as a caretaker, and she resided in her small cottage on the Rookwood estate. So that cottage doesn't exist anymore. Um, but it's the housing development now that we mentioned. So um, we can look at the outside of her cottage and have a good look at Anne there with some in the background. Uh, and then this is from, yeah, the Foley family collection included many interior shots of the Odell home in Halifax, which was very nice indeed in the late 1890s, but they're not Fredericton, so we'll just show this one. It's kind of interesting. They had a spinning wheel in there. I don't know if they would have had to spin anything themselves, but. Uh, there it is. So, uh, yeah, and this is the, not the cottage obviously, but this is the Odell's home itself, uh, Rookwood Estate. So, um, let me see here. And we do have, in that collection of Foley stuff, one picture of the interior of the Fredericton home came in, and this is the first I'd ever seen of it. So it's pretty interesting. We can look at a few different details inside the home. This is the only shot we have. Uh, They've got a saber displayed, and those are all uh, cabinet cards, which are a popular type of uh, roughly five by seven picture, that was, you know, in the later 19th century, displayed on the mantle of taxidermied animals and so on. So, yeah, and I don't know what that is in the fireplace, but it's got ornate kind of decoration carving around it. I think so. Um, so this is, uh, I'm going to shift and talk about a building, oh, I, I forgot to mention, that building we were just looking at the inside of uh, burned in the 40s, so it hasn't been around, and the fact that we have an interior shot is pretty neat. So uh, I'm going to shift and talk about a building that is still around, and we're going to look at the ways it changed through time, basically, from pre-photography right up until, well, not today, but 1900 or so. So... <laughs> This is a new government house. That's what this was called when it was built. So uh, it's a color lithograph from 1831, uh, three years after the building was completed. Um, it's been attributed to different people, so we don't really know who drew this. Um, 
But what we can look at, if we just quickly go through this little pictorial history of Old Government House, is we can see the ways that it changed from the different inhabitants. So we've got no kind of extras built onto the structure. It looks more or less like it does today in this original uh, engraving of it. If we skip to 1857, uh, some of you folks might remember this from last talk, uh, if you were here. Uh, they, this is one of the three oldest known photographs of Fredericton taken by a Civil War photographer named George Stacy, who was from Maine. He came from Maine up to Fredericton, cut his teeth here, and then went to shoot Civil War scenes, basically. But when he was here, he advertised the sale of four or five different pictures of public buildings, uh, and this was one of them. So if you look at this, this is during the tenure of uh, the Lieutenant Governor called Manners Sutton, and he and his family are outside. But what we're really looking at is just some weird details of the house, which were only there for about 10 years, it seems. They've got a little entrance structure here, and they've got some kind of strange wooden kind of castle-y structure on the end of it. So you can see this here. Probably the Lieutenant Governor with his family. And yes, this wooden structure on the end. Uh, by the time we get to the 1860s, Arthur Hamilton Gordon uh, is the Lieutenant Governor. There's no kind of enclosure. Oops, I forgot to say that. Also, this, see the entranceway is kind of closed in, which is quite strange. 1860s, it's opened up and there's nothing strange built there. But this uh, little wooden kind of ramparty thing is still there. And I just read the other day in uh, Squire's History of Fredericton that when Gordon was there, this is Gordon's you know, time in the 1860s, he kept a zoo on the old government house grounds, apparently, with animals from you know, the woods of New Brunswick. So I don't know for sure that's where a zoo was, but it was somewhere, and I don't know what else that building was. Someone else might know, but there was a zoo somewhere <laughs> for 10, or 10 years or so while he was here. Uh, yeah, and then by the time Tilly uh, moves in as Lieutenant Governor, they build a very nice conservatory, kind of glass house on the end, which they're in the process of building in this 1870s picture. It's not been glassed in. And we skip ahead a little bit, and it gets, of course, uh, filled with glass. And here's the interior of it, with uh, two of Tilly's uh, sons sitting in there. And it's pretty fancy. Oops, sorry. <laughs> that, he didn't have the bear in there. That was something else altogether. But anyway, so yeah, this is the interior of the conservatory. Uh, the boys in the photo are LPD and Herbert Tilly. Uh, yep. So Tilly, Samuel Leonard Tilly was the father of Confederation, uh, responsible for helping to bring New Brunswick into Canada. He was also, he had two terms as Premier in New Brunswick and held federal ministerial posts, and he served twice as Lieutenant Governor in the province. So, yeah. And after all the uh, stuff we've just seen, this, these 40 or 50 years of uh, that old government house history, it went on in the 20th century. Uh, actually, after the Deaf and Dumb Institute burned, the one that we saw the ruins of, it moved into this building. Uh, so it had a temporary home there. And then in the 20th century, it, had, uh, it was a military hospital, RCMP J division headquarters, and a number of other things as well. And now it's back to being the residence of the Lieutenant Governor again. So, so um, there's a quote uh, I heard in my undergrad, which I really like. It's a kind of like a proverb now that people know. Uh, that says, the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. So I think that's very true. Um, this is a, and photographs are kind of one of the ways that we can help, you know, uh, understand the real difference of the past and how it was, uh, you know, it's, they were like us, but it is, it's akin to being in a different country, basically. Because um, their mindsets weren't like ours were. So this is a stereographic view of Bear dancing with crowd watching in front of the Salt Box House on Westmoreland Street. The house doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but it stood at 135 Westmoreland uh, and was sold to John Toner in 1878. Uh, the house was moved to King's Landing to function as an interpretive education facility. So uh, we can see here, if you look at a few details, we know all the folks in this picture actually. Evelyn Toner holding Fred Toner, Harry Toner standing beside them all watching the bear, and Jack and Clement Toner are peeking out the upstairs window to see what's going on in the street. His performer had just shambled up, so. Yes, and so in this kind of little group of images speaking to the past as a foreign country, I've, uh, some of you might have seen this before, this is Marysville Cotton Mill uh, interior showing child laborers about 1887. Uh, so well into the early 20th century, uh, government reports on the conditions of factories noted 
the regrettable but necessary persistence of child laborers in New Brunswick. So particularly in factory work such as this, you know, they had small hands and everything, so they could uh, yeah, do a lot of jobs. So they knew they shouldn't have been doing it in the early 20th century, but they were just so useful. So basically, that's what they were arguing in the, in the reports. So uh, yeah, that's uh, just a detail shot of showing some of the folks, the kids working there. Uh, yeah, so the old post office on the east corner of Queen and Carlton Streets, uh, built in 1881. Um, the photo, this photo is taken between 81 and 86. So we're looking at crowds gathered, probably to watch a parade, or the arrival of someone from the wharf, which is just out of frame to the left. So we can see, oh, that's it today. Sports Hall of Fame, everybody recognizes it. If you look at some of the details, whatever was going on was a pretty major event. They built a makeshift bandstand outside the old post office. Uh, out of like sawhorses and some planking, and <laughs> but not too many. Yeah, it doesn't look too safe. They've all got their music notes on a little stand there, and uh, but most people aren't looking at the band. If you take a look, a lot of people are looking off towards the river. So it looks like somebody might be arriving. Ladies on the roof watching parade uh, or an arrival. I think probably more likely. Uh, children and infants on the post office balcony balcony, it's pretty thin, uh, watching you know, whatever's going on. Uh, there's kids hanging over the railing. And remember the sufficiency of methods for killing children off that were in active operation in the city. No problem, no shortage of them. And everybody here is turned towards where, where the wharf would have been, or a or landing anyway, so old customs house. Uh, a lot of people might have seen this one, but they might not have seen all the interesting details that are in it. Uh, it's Lady MacDonald, as in Sir John A. MacDonald's uh, wife, laying the cornerstone of the first railway bridge at Fredericton, uh, August 15, 1887. So uh, if we zoom in, we can see from left to right uh, Sir Leonard Tilly, Lady MacDonald, looking very pleased with the stone she's about to uh, lay down. <laughs> Senator Thomas Temple beside her, and then Subdean Alexander of Christ Church and Gilmore Brown, who's the bridge designer. So if you poke around this photograph a little bit, this comes from a glass negative. There's like a tremendous amount of detail if we just get into it and dig into it. Um, above the rest of everyone else, John A. McDonald and Lady Tilly look on while a dog sleeps at their feet. This is going to be a recurring theme also in this talk. Um, it's, it's, you'd be hard pressed to find, especially an outdoor photo taken in the 19th century, that a dog wasn't sleeping or jumping into the frame or something like that. They seem to roam the streets pretty freely. And uh, I don't know if he brought the dog with him, but it looks like it's welcome there. It's sleeping on a mat that they've put outside. So <laughs> it's pretty good. Um, so the bridge was, yeah, the, the cornerstone was laid in 87 and the bridge finished construction in 1888. It's only the second bridge to cross the St. John at Fredericton uh, after the Carlton Street Bridge we were looking at. Uh, before that, it was all ferries and ice roads. So this original bridge was replaced in 1935 uh, when it was damaged during a freshup. Uh, well, it was damaged in 35 and reopened in 1938, so. Uh, this is some more shots of the bridge construction after they've laid the stone and actually had to do the work. And so we're looking over into um, Devon, or what was called Gibson at that time. And we can see if we zoom in here a little bit, Gibson leather, the tannery is here, and the leather factory or whatever is here. So they were drying leather out here. Uh, we can see some of the workers, and they have had not even laid any stones. They're kind of building forms for it, basically. And if you look over here, folks probably recognize it's the Pickeroons building today which has been kind of, it's turned into a, a nice little bar, so that's still there, but it had some troubles, we'll see in a second. You can see a bunch of guys in suits. I don't think they're the laborers. Uh, I think they're like looky-loos, like tire kickers. I think they're coming to check out this major construction project. And I think there's some kids down here who I don't think are moving the stones either, so this is probably just a post photo. <laughs> but if we look over into Gibson, we can see a few things here. Basically, all this land that we're looking at was owned by Gibson, Alexander Gibson, of course. So he had the businesses over here, and he was he he was uh, he controlled the New Brunswick Railway as well. So this was a lot of, was uh, New Brunswick Railway land. So these were uh, MB Railway cottages and then the workshops over here, 
and there was an, a much larger, actually round roundhouse just upriver from the thing that they call the roundhouse today, which is not particularly round, but uh, it did have trains in it. So. Uh, yeah, so we can see again there, that's just some of the MB railway buildings. And this faintly in the background is the original roundhouse, which burned, uh, I think, in 1893. But they never rebuilt that one, and it was quite a it was quite a building actually. So, uh, yeah, we're looking again at this. Uh, so the land in the background became Carlton Park, and also you can see over here, just beyond the wharf, basically somewhere here is where Ducks Unlimited is. If you guys know that big building, um, and I didn't know this, but the last time I spoke about uh, these images, uh, my the councillor for my ward uh, said that the Carlton Park was gifted. Uh, by Irving, I didn't know that the land on which it sat, so or which it sits now. So, I knew that they had the kind of tankers on the other side of the bridge. But anyway, there you go. Uh, yeah, and we can see some of the buildings I was referring to and the wharf back there as well, and brighten it up. This long building they used to call the tunnel, I think, for obvious reasons, and a bunch of wood probably from Gibson's operation, which floated them down Nashua River. So this is another uh, cool uh, York Sunbury Historical Society image. It shows the Canada Eastern Railway locomotive destroyed by fire. So this is the Pickerons Roundhouse. Um, it did burn in 1898 pretty bad, pretty completely. But the newspaper uh, article that a colleague of mine found uh, in October uh, said that they were planning to promptly rebuild it. So they used the portions of the existing uh, brickwork that were still there <laughs> and uh, they rebuilt it. So some of the building that you can drink in now was on fire, definitely, at one point. So yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And the Babbitts, who I mentioned earlier, the amateur photographers, they were, this is some of their crew here. This is a Babbitt uh, photograph. And uh, they would, they must have heard about the fire and ran across the bridge to check it out, basically. So if you can see right up there, they're posed with a little dog who appears in a lot of their photos as well. They brought them on all their adventures, basically. So <laughs> this is, they took two pictures. You can see a number of, uh, of uh, engines destroyed, basically, right before they got to rebuilding, probably the next day. So we're gonna look at a few, another building uh, kind of quickly through time. But this is one that isn't around anymore and hasn't been around for over 130 or 40 years. So, you know, before my time. Uh, this is a lithograph from 1850 uh, showing view of what's called Province Hall. So this was the original legislature uh, before the one that was built that we have today, basically. Um, what's really neat is a lot of people have seen this image and some of these old lithographs and stuff, but few people have seen the originals or scans of the originals, because they actually have lost so much quality being reproduced for the last 170 years. Uh, every reproduction is poorer than the last, basically. Uh, they've lost a lot of the detail, and one of the ones we see, uh, if we see them on, uh, you know, scans on the internet, little ones or whatever. But if you zoom in, there's actually a lot of stuff happening in each one of them that we can see. It's quite interesting. So you can see the details of the building, 1850. Um, you can also see some Malacita uh, Wolisikoi uh, people selling baskets down in the corner. So um, Andrea Bear Nicholas, for you folks who know her, has written this a really amazing article about early depictions of Malacita people in New Brunswick art. And this is one of the pieces that she looks at. And she says that uh, even the ones in the 1840s and 50s essentially, um, yeah, they're, they're always shown selling baskets and they're shown better dressed and they don't appear to be, you know, in distress or whatever. But basically the argument she makes is that all of these uh, depictions kind of uh, aren't telling much of the story about what was really happening at the time, which was that they were losing a lot of their land and uh, they were in trouble. And basket selling in cities was one of the ways that had become, or sorry, a means of making some money that had become, uh, yeah, a, main, a major means of survival by the 1840s even. Uh, yeah, so this is Province Hall. This is, uh, of, the, of the three oldest photos of Fredericton, uh, this is the one I discovered or identified most recently. And this is kind of cool because the other three, all taken in 1857, uh, the other two rather are Christchurch, there's a picture of Christchurch and a picture of Old Government House, uh, which are still around, so it's not terribly exciting uh, that we have old pictures of those because they didn't change that much. Province Hall, though, it's kind of nice that we, this happens to be one of our 1857 shots. It was a building which isn't around anymore. So, yeah, uh, you can see lots of details of the building because it's quite a nice, well-preserved old print if you zoom in. 
Um, the first time I showed this, I asked what these were. One person suggested they were to allow for the circulation of air underneath the building. And if anyone agrees or disagrees, we can uh, talk about it later. But uh, <laughs> yeah. So now oh, we have a few shots of the interior of Province Hall as well. This is probably the 1870s. You can see what it looked like uh, there again, another shot when it's relatively empty. Uh, these are just little copies that we have from glass negatives. They're not the original. And we can see, if you look closely here, another shot we have from the 1870s. Uh, the lads on the steps there, hanging out. And many lovely 19th century wooden New Brunswick buildings would keep rain barrels outside in case of a fire. This was a good idea, uh, but it didn't really help them that much <laughs> because the building burned down anyway. This is a, a lithograph of the destruction of that building by fire uh, in 1880. So the firemen were out pumping away, but uh, they couldn't save it. And as you can imagine, it was quite a scene. So the person who sketched this uh, picture, which was published in a national newspaper, uh, has everyone out, kids out, whole families came out to, to watch the fun. So uh, <laughs> yeah, that happened. Uh, this shows the interior that we were looking at earlier. So we can see the ruins of it kind of side by side. That was the chamber right there, basically. That, we got, that was burned. Uh, and this is uh, showing a different part of town. If we look quickly at Phoenix Square, uh, which is kind of what we're looking at here, because this is one of the first, you could call it town halls. It was the tank house where they kept water for in case buildings burned, basically. But we're gonna, if we look at some of the things here, there's, they're hauling hay, and there's a hay scale back here. So people were selling hay in Fredericton since, you know, well, from the settlement of Fredericton, basically, there was always a market for it. And the scale there, again, we see more mousy people. This is in one corner, uh, selling baskets and some other handcrafts here, showing what you'd see downtown Fredericton, basically. Um, more mousy folks possibly hauling caribou or something, antlers poking out of there, and some officers, or some soldiers in the bottom right. If we go ahead to the 1880s and 90s, uh, there's plenty of pictures of the lively market that was outside City Hall. Huge uh, stacks of hay uh, here in the winter time at the winter market. And right here we have, just across the street, actually we, have, we can see where we're at right here. We zoom across the street. This is um, AF Randolph's. If you know the Randolph building, which is just beyond town hall, the City Hall, uh, it's still called the Randolph Building, and across the road he had a bank called the People's Bank of New Brunswick, uh, the stone building here. And it, the architecture of this bank would look like it was kind of emulating other New Brunswick uh, bank styles, especially the ones in St. John. So this is a, a bank of uh, New Brunswick, the old bank of New Brunswick, uh, which still exists on Prince William Street in St. John. So our Fredericton Bank was kind of a little brother to this building with like a miniaturized uh, style and scale of the other one. So if we look around uh, Phoenix Square and see some of the, the hay for sale, uh, this huge haystack, we're looking at the corner of York and Queen, and we can see it uh, right here, clearly, the corner, and we can compare with today to see what Tony's looks like, which we all know. But this is basically the view that we're, we're looking at side by side there. So uh, this is, again, the booming market in the 1890s, hay all over the place. Uh, people can bring hay from lots of places outside the city and sell it there, obviously. This is a man admiring his hay at Kingsclear. I thought I'd throw that in there. Um, so, and uh, again, jumping ahead into the 20th century just for a minute to show that through time, from the 1830s to the 1830s to 1930s, uh, winter market horses and loads of hay. This one's at the rear of City Hall Square, so Phoenix Square again. And we can see folks are selling hay, wood, 1930s. Madge Smith went around, the lady I mentioned earlier, and took pictures that were kind of you know, unconventional, just day-to-day -day life, basically. Uh, you can see lots of wood for sale here. Horses parked beside trucks, which is kind of always a fun thing to see that they overlap that much. Uh, boys, possibly from St. Mary's, selling baskets at the summer market, so that we were looking at winter market before, but there was a really active kind of produce and handicrafts uh, market in front of City Hall. Uh, as well, so you can see that there. Um, some of the variety of stuff on offer. Uh, the same boys again from different angle, and that's the Randolph building over here. This is in the late 30s, early 40s, and Harvey Studio over there, which is still around. 
uh, fruit and flower vendors uh, along the city hall, the walls of city hall. Or just a quick jump ahead in time here. Uh, veggie vendors in the 1940s. And then, yeah, also, I'm just showing some other uses of the space around City Hall, basically. Uh, hauling ice, so some folks might know, uh, I mean, you all probably know well, it was used for refrigeration, so they cut from the St. John River. Uh, and this has gone back, you know, as long as ice boxes have. And then hauled it up uh, on a road behind City Hall, and they could store it and then deliver it around the city, basically. So we just jumped ahead. Um, this is the military compound in Fredericton. This is a colorized photo, uh, probably taken about 1876. We can see the officers' quarters in the background over here with the wooden section on front still attached. And a few other things. Oh, the uh, soldiers' barracks and so on. This was actually taken uh, during the construction of the normal school. So we looked at last time how a bunch of buildings had to come down in order for the normal school to go up. Uh, normal school and that later justice building. So we can see here a bit of the rubble from some of the, like the old military hospital that was taken down on this corner. And again, 1876, this shows the foundation of the normal school. So, and after that burned in the 30s, it was rebuilt in a super, in a very similar style in the same location and stayed as the normal school for another few decades before switching to the Justice Building. So we're going to take a quick look at, uh, you know, we're looking at all these kind of macro level cityscapes and stuff, uh, leaving out the social aspect of history, which photos can tell us a lot about, basically. Uh, people haven't been uh, much in focus in these pictures so far. So we're going to have a look at some more people and what they were up to about 120 years ago. Uh, so some of these early amateur photographers like the Babbitts, give us valuable insight into the home life uh, around the turn of the century. So this is a party of uh, Babbitt family and friends. For a variety of reasons, uh, early photos of people playing instruments are really rare. So this is kind of a cool one, shows us what they were up to. Uh, there's been really little research on early music in New Brunswick. So a single picture like this uh, tells us who was playing what types of instruments. Uh, and in what combination and so on. So that's pretty cool. We've got a lady on a, a mandolin, a little kind of bullback mandolin. Uh, also another young lady playing banjo, having tea. This fellow's holding a fiddle and she's probably playing a piano or a pump organ, but probably a piano over there, so. Oh yes, and the, old fe the older fellow on the, on the left is labeled as Loring Bailey in the original album. This is also a York Sunbury Historical Society image. Uh, it doesn't look like L.W. Bailey, Loring Ward, but it could be Loring Bailey Jr., who I've never seen any other pictures of, so. Um, this is another party, a picnic party downriver from Fredericton in the 1890s. It might have been taken by the Babbitt family. Uh, the same dog who appears in all the other ba Babbitt photos <laughs> appears in this one as well. If he's here, oh yeah, he's here somewhere. Oh yes, he is, yep. Yeah. Right over there. He goes on tour around Fredericton with them in all seasons in this photograph, so. There's at least three styles of boats visible. That's kind of interesting. The pointed ones are more of a, a, a malice malicebalistic way. And this is just a, a broad bottom boat. And the rounded edges look more like a Mi'kmaq boat, basically, um, a canoe rather. Anyway, so if we look at these guys here, uh, yeah, the banjo guys. For those of you with keen eyesight, you might recognize the banjo players. Uh, I think some of you have seen them before. Uh, it's there. They also appear in one of our most famous images, which was just it's simply labeled Banjo Players on the St. John River, 1890s, which is a great picture, and it's been used for different types of publicity all the time. And there's people standing up in their canoes back there, which is very dangerous, but anyway, <laughs> no. So, and if you look closely, people have seen this before, but it's a lot of fun. It's just an oar with a newspaper on it. And they've got probably a PV shoved into something into the riverbed or whatever, holding their raft in place down here. So that's great. So these guys make an appearance in a few other photos. That's a lot of fun. So like I said, it's one of our most famous images. Uh, lately, it's been used. Uh, Pickaroons, they kind of, they, I think they used the photo for something, but then they did a little cartoon version of it. And I think this is what's, it's on the dooryard. I don't think, I know. It's on the dooryard beer bottle, so uh, yeah. They just put them in front of our uh, railway bridge, so. But anyway, you can tell it's the same dudes, obviously, so. Anyway, if we look at this other York Sunbury Historical Society image, this is a 
taking pictures indoors, um, even when there was electricity with the old cameras, it was pretty challenging. So flashlight photography was a really new thing at the end of the 19th century, especially in New Brunswick. So this is a really kind of a rare, I know it looks a little mundane, but it's a rare insight into, like I said, home life because the Babbitts were experimenters and they, they played with flashlight photography at a time that it was super rare. So this is Thanksgiving evening probably after dinner, by the way, that they all look really relaxed. Uh, November in 1897. So in the, we have a, both a print and negative version of this. In the print version, which is a family album, one woman's uh, face was scratched out and a pencil note reads, why did you do this, mom? Like, so mom went through and edited out pictures she didn't like. So <laughs> another uh, version, yeah, another uh, note identifies Mr. Lee Babbitt and Miss A. McLaughlin are in this picture. And what I really like about it is this is uh, this little guy <laughs> who's hiding under the plant here. Um, it's probably the archive's earliest example of photo bombing. It's the, oldest, <laughs> it's the oldest example I've seen in New Brunswick anyway. So he's the only one who uh, isn't going to play along with a photographer, I guess. So that's great. He's peeking out from under there. We have a few other uh, interior shots from the, like the, uh, the late 1890s, but we don't know very much about them. We don't know who they are. This is probably a Fredericton interior. Uh, but they do provide a bit of insight into the character of domestic life and leisure. You can see how they decorated their homes, what kind of stuff they had too. So you can zoom around the picture. Uh, the, the woman appears to be tatting, which is a word I hadn't heard before, but doing lace work, prob probably making a doily it looks like. Uh, they've got photos and other pictures all over their walls, prints and real photographs, rocking chair, lamp books, other domestic items. Um, it's pretty hard to see, but believe it or not, uh, there was a calendar on the wall. They had a little picture calendar, and I was able to look at it and compare the dates that you can look at historic calendars and stuff. Anyway, it was taken in 1899, because it had no writing and no dating or whatever, so I just had to kind of figure it out. So I'd stared at it for a long time until numbers emerged from the calendar. So, uh, and then we can see what she was up to there. So uh, yeah, so we'll just look at a couple more, um, and then I'll wrap it up here, I think if that's all right. But um, this is a street level view of 217 George Street in Fredericton. It's a home with a neat little horizontal board fence outside. And uh, this is still around. Now this building, I was working on these photos about a week ago, and I'll, all I knew about them was that it had a real Fredericton feel to it. But I didn't, I had no idea anything about them. So I sent them to a few colleagues and friends, and uh, one of them came through and showed me that it was 217 George, which is still around. It's on our uh, Fredericton Heritage Trust website. So uh, if we look, we also have a shot from that. I was able to tell that we have a shot inside the same building <coughs> as well. So this is the interior living room with the family of probably Leonard Johnson, um, probably Leonard at the far left there, uh, sitting around in chairs, about 1900. And had this lovely window, stained glass window, and it has a, uh, a verse on it that says, Lord, I confess to when I dine, the pulse is thine. So these poems are from, uh, or these lines are from a poem by a 17th century uh, English poet named Robert Herrick. So they're beautiful windows, and the way that I was able to find out where this house was was uh, John LaRue, the architect who writes a lot, uh, that we've all, that many of us have seen his book. Uh, he recognized it because he'd uh, written a book about stained glass in Fredericton. And he said, he basically said, you've barked up the right tree. And he started sending me these lovely color photos of the, uh, of the interior there. So that's what it looks like today. And it's all hand painted, so it's very nice. Yeah, from his book, Glorious Light. Uh, we can see what people are up to. The kids with their dolls and this very unusual long rocking chair, which looks pretty comfortable. And we can see scenes of uh, work life as well, too, which we don't see a lot of uh, interior work in the 1890s. This is a, a laundry, maybe inside the Queen Hotel, because a number of uh, uh, the towels and stuff uh, say Queen Hotel on them. It's like embroidered. So indoor photography would have been pretty rare. And to take an indoor scene that wasn't a family is pretty unusual, too, basically. So we can see a Queen Hotel written on some of them there. The laundry dog almost kept still for the photo. So as I mentioned, they're everywhere. They're even in the laundries for some reason. He's the only one who's blurry. He was just, just impatient enough to get blurred in the photo. So uh, the happy laundry crew, they don't look terribly happy, 1890s. 
And we look over here, so um, this is also interesting because it's kind of at really a common place shot that no one would have thought was important enough to take a picture of in the 1890s, but we get to have a look into it. And, you know, uh, visible minorities and women especially are pretty underrepresented in early photography. So women's work um, and jobs that were, or professions that were open to women, obviously we don't have a lot of pictures of them engaged in them, so this is one of them. And along the same lines, two men sawing firewood in uh, the George Taylor family's yard at 232 Northumberland Street. That house is still around as well. It's got a little plaque on it uh, while well, children look on. So this is in the 1870s. Um, so again, your everyday work, you don't get to see a lot of what people are up to. And it's just because the fellow who they were working for happened to be Fredericton's greatest photographer that he went out and took a picture of what was going on, basically. So. And we can have a look at these guys installing water mains on Northumberland Street. Um, George Taylor looked like he took some, the photographer, some uh, contracts to, uh, to document city public works and stuff like that because he went and took pictures of different buildings and uh, kind of everyday labor stuff that's pretty neat that we wouldn't have otherwise if the city hadn't asked for it. So I think we'll probably end with this, uh, this two, two or three pictures of the uh, Royal Canadian Regiment um, uh, training at Hermitage Creek, which is uh, just up Woodstock Road between the cemeteries, basically. Uh, so this picture uh, is your, you know, a bog standard uh, photo of military men standing in the woods. It's not particularly interesting, but there is another, oh, this is where Hermitage Creek is roughly. It goes into the St. John here. Uh, this is the Wilmot Rural Cemetery. Um, they took a serious photo, but they also took a fun photo. Uh, because if anybody knows, you know, folks in the military, it's not always all serious all the time. Some percentage of the time it is. <laughs> but anyway, so we can zoom in on this one and see what was up. Uh, we've got guys. This guy's bending over. I'm not sure what he's doing. This guy's holding his uh, snowshoe like a cricket bat. This guy has made his snowshoe or something into a giant ice cream cone and is eating it. These two boys are having a uh, snowball fight, and there's a lot of other general shenanigans going on. So this is probably the one that they actually wanted a copy of. But uh, yeah, anyway. So I won't go on unless I should, but I think I'll, I'll probably end on this one, so yeah. Yeah, all right. I'd like to thank you very much, uh, Josh. Uh, this is a, an excellent, uh, there's an excellent crowd here tonight, which tells me a lot about the great interest in uh, early Fredericton photographs. And you know, this is part two, and uh, we have a, just as good of a crowd, if not more, than we did at part one. So I'm glad to see that interest uh, uh, was maintained. Uh, you know, they say every picture uh, tells a story, or what is it that every picture has a, has a thousand words? Um, uh, but that's certainly true here tonight. Uh, can you imagine what it must have been like the day they took that photo away? Just I imagine myself, it just transports you back into time and, you know, to the day that it was taken. And it, it, uh, it brings you into the past and it brings the past back to life as well, which is what every good photo archivist and a historian aims to do, I think. And I'd also like to encourage you to pick up copies of our free uh, officers' quarterlies that are in the back. Um, we brought some with us to show you the wonderful uh, uh, publications that we produce uh, and which are given uh, to members of the uh, members of the York Center Historical Society and we encourage you to join the York Center Historical Society if you haven't already. And uh, there are some lovely um, chocolates and done by none other than Cora Mavornia who has uh, once again outdone herself and uh, you'll be amazed uh, by the uh, chocolates that she makes. And uh, there's some uh, juice and I believe some uh, water and, and drinks in the back. So please feel free to uh, stay, talk to Josh if you have any questions. Some people are shy, I know. And uh, I really encourage you to come back at, at our next event. And thank you so much for coming tonight to uh, listen to this wonderful talk again by Josh. Thank you very much. Thank you.